The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. The thing I wanted to do today is to introduce perturbation theory. Uh, to show how we use it to make the link between the molecular constants, which are multiplied by quantum numbers, functions of quantum numbers, and the uh, physical constants, the constants that determine the potential energy curve or potential energy surface. This is essential in all of uh, spectroscopic theory. And so I'm jumping ahead to do an example, which is not completely trivial, where we use perturbation theory. And what I discovered, you know, it's really nice in some ways to have a course retired for 10 or 12 years uh, because I can come back to it fresh and I can see that there was something profoundly wrong with what I had been lecturing on for the previous 25 years. So the example in lectures two and three which I use to introduce a lot of important ideas, which is the uh, doubly degenerate bending vibration of a linear molecule, is fundamentally flawed. Because uh, the Hamiltonian has to be totally symmetric. And uh, so, for a linear molecule, you have cylindrical symmetry. And so, the terms that I was manipulating in the example do not have cylindrical symmetry. And so, uh, and I did some symmetry-related things with them, and those were interesting and useful, but the basic equations that I derived do not apply to any physically realizable system. So I'm going to try to do uh, a problem where I introduce perturbation theory. Uh, and uh, perturbation theory is always messy. And what you do is when you apply perturbation theory to a problem, you get horrible equations, horrible derivations. And then you compress them, and they become beautiful and elegant after you've found all your algebraic mistakes and stuff like that. So let us. Uh, just deal with uh, a diatomic molecule rather than a, a linear triatomic molecule. And we'll uh, uh, have a, um, so the, the zero order picture is rigid rotor see this, you see, well, that's ridiculous. Because if the molecule is vibrating, it can't be a rigid rotor. But that's our zero order, order picture. This is the way we think about diatomic molecules. And then we're going to introduce corrections for uh, non-rigidity. And at the same time, anonymity. So once we do this, the, the, the absurdity of having a rigid vibrating rotor uh, is removed because at the same time we allow the vibration, the, the rotational constant to be a, a function of coordinate, and we allow the, the vibrations to be analog. So I'm going to work through this problem and uh, try to point out the important things that happen. Uh, and, uh, but it won't be as elegant as it could have been if I had an extra three or four hours to reconstruct a lecture completely. And so what I probably will do is ask you to, to convert this to elegant format as a problem. However, 
That problem is handled completely in one of the supplements to lecture number three. Right. Okay, so the Hamiltonian for a harmonic oscillator, we have p squared g mu, reduced mass. So that's the kinetic energy term. And the kinetic energy term, the potential, this is the kinetic energy term. And the potential energy term is one half a uh, r squared, q squared, let's call it. And um, uh, now I see why this, this, the blackboards in this room are not as, quite as nice as some of the in uh, some of the other lecture rooms. You can push the blackboard down. Here you can only go up, and as a result, there's uh, it's harder to display Greek. Okay, so uh, we know that the energy levels for a harmonic oscillator are going to have the form Hc omega D e equals N. Now why is this Hc? In spectroscopy, we use the quantity reciprocal centimeters to mean energy, frequency, anything we want. So we, the, this, this factor of Hc is, comes and goes as will, at will. Now, I'm going to include it for a while, but eventually I'm going to re resort to spectroscopic convention of calling omega e an energy. Okay, so the vibrational energy levels are, uh, no, you know this, you've done the harmonic oscillator many times, you know that the energy levels for a harmonic oscillator which has this Hamiltonian are this. And the Vibrational frequencies, or two pi c, k, okay. Now, what I'm going to do is introduce something you may not have seen before, and that's dimensionless coordinates. So the the coordinate I call it Q, so uh, can be written as a dimensionless coordinate. And so all of the dimensions, all of the trivial stuff, gets put into a factor h bar over 2 pi c mu omega square root. So this is a factor that strips out the uh, specific oscillator, the mass and the force constant information from the coordinate. Now we have something universal. Why do we like that? Uh, because we're going to be replacing Q and P by A dagger and A, creation and annihilation operator, which make the algebra a lot simpler. And leads to, uh, it allows you to see the universal behavior of a problem much more transparently. So we have Q, we've made it dimensionless Q with a half. We have P, uh, there's a similar factor to make P dimensionless. Okay, so again, the Specific characteristics, the mass and the frequency or the force constant and the reduced mass, they're in these uh, prefactors. And then uh, we can write Q hat as 1 over square root 2 A dagger plus A. And we can write P hat. And I'm going to put, make these bold because. Uh, I'm going to be using a constant A later, and there's nothing to be done about that. And so we get 1 over square root 2 times I times A dagger minus A. So we can write the coordinate, the dimensionless coordinate, and the dimensionless momentum in terms of these 
universal factor. Now, why do we like these? Well, a dagger. That's the selection rule. There's one non-zero matrix element for any combination of A's and A daggers. And whenever A dagger or A operates between two states with the, the matrix element you know to be zero from uh, the uh, just the, the algebra, how many this has got one A dagger and no A's, and so B has to increase. This is one A and no A daggers. B has to decrease by one. So you know that these are the non-zero guys. Then you just look at this and you say, oh, let's take the larger B, the larger vibration quantum number, and take the square root of it. That's the value of the matrix L. So this may seem like, well, well why not just evaluate matrix elements of Q and D? Because Q has two non-zero matrix elements, delta V of 1 and delta V of minus 1. V, P has delta V of 1 and delta V of minus 1. If we have functions of Q and P, we end up getting a proliferation of non-zero matrix elements in cross terms. Whereas if we're doing an algebra with A's and A daggers, we can always sort things out. And so you can always say, oh, well, here is the only non-zero matrix element of this collection of A's and A daggers. And this is what it is. And so it, it allows you to do the algebra at the beginning before things get complicated, rather than after uh, you've got the whole problem set up and you say, oh my god, I have to do all that rather good stuff. So uh, this is a really powerful uh, tool and I'm going to try to illustrate its use. Okay, so now, let's talk about perturbation theory. Because this tool was really born for the use in perturbation theory. So, in perturbation theory, now I'm not going to derive the equations of perturbation theory, I'm going to just remind you of the derivation. In perturbation theory, we say we have a Hamiltonian, and we divide it up, into a zero order term. And this is not just algebra, this is insight. Because what we call a zero order term is the thing that we're going to use as our magic decoder. It is the thing that provides us with a picture of what the molecule is doing. And everything else is just correcting for what we left out. And sometimes we choose a picture which is physical which is almost the truth. And sometimes we choose a picture which is computationally convenient. And it may not be the truth, but it really it enables us to do all the algebra. But usually the H0 is the picture we're using to describe what the system is doing. And then we, 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 we add, to, to be correct, uh, a correction term and maybe another correction term. 
Now this lambda is a computer, an algebraic device. It, it's some people call it a sorting, a, a smallness parameter, but it's really just a way of enforcing a separation of equations into uh, uh, things that we can manipulate. It's a way of saying how do we enforce uh, these perturbations. Now, we do the same thing for the wave function. We have the zero order wave function, the first order correction to the wave function, and the second order correction to the wave function, etc. And we have the energy. sense to put indices on these because we're interested in the corrections to particular wave functions in particular states. So this is the, the formal structure we use and what we're going to do is write the Schrodinger equation a sub i, e sub i, and divide this up into terms according to the power of lambda. So we have a lambda zero equation, a lambda one equation, a lambda two equation. And so the purpose of lambda is not uh, really a smallness parameter, but it's a way of defining three independent equations or more that have to be satisfied. So it's just a way of saying we have certain stuff which we're going to use to define the way we look at the problem, and then we stick all the errors into another equation, and then we stick all the errors into the third equation. So this equation, the lambda zero terms, give you h zero psi zero p zero psi zero, and we'll look in this example. So this equation says we have a set of functions, which are eigenfunctions of h0, and energy levels, which are eigenvalues of h0. And that's what we're going to use to solve all the problems. So whatever we choose for h0 has a consequence. We get this psi zeros and e zeros. And those are all going to be manipulated. And it's also going to define our point of view. The lambda to the 1 equation gives us the correction to the wave function. And uh, that correction to the wave function has the form sum over j prime, j not equal to i, what the prime means, h, uh, yeah, I'm going to do that, h i j 1 over e i 0 minus e. Okay, so the correction to the wave function is expressed in terms of the difference between zero order energies, which we know, because we did this. And it's, I'll get to you in a second. And it's going to be matrix elements of this correction term to the Hamiltonian. Josh. You will put a side J. I knew I should be postponed for a second. So we have these and we have this. Zero. And we have defined an H1 term and we have certain integrals of that that we have to calculate. So that's the first time we have to do some work. But usually we choose H0 so, so that these integrals are and they're really trivial when you're using these A's and A daggers. The length of the one equation also gives you uh, E1 I, which is um, H1 I I. So, uh, we get the first order corrections to the energies from the diagonal elements of the first perturbation term 
and we get the corrections the way from The lambda squared term, among other things, gives us E2, correct, the second correction to the energy, which is H1 I J H1 J I E I 0 minus E J 0 sum I J. Okay, so the correction to the energy is a bunch of off diagonal matrix elements of the correction term squared over an energy number. So we know this, we have to do some work here. We can also say that uh, it's, uh, plus H2. Okay, so we just go through and we do all this stuff. That we haven't solved the problem yet, but we have the machinery now. Okay, now an important point. For most problems, we say we have H0 and everything else. You notice that uh, the first time we see H2 is here, and it doesn't change anything by saying all of the terms that are not in H0 are in H prime, or H1, and so forget about this. And for almost all problems in diatomic molecules, one uh, says all of the perturbations are in one term. For most problems in polyatomic vibrations, it makes sense to keep track of the orders. And so they don't do this. Many of the same techniques are used, but, uh, and for years I thought, why do people who do vibrations in polyatomics keep these extra terms, it just makes their algebra more complicated. But it turns out it doesn't. It's, it's really important. But for, for our problems, we will stop the perturbation expansion of the Hamiltonian to one term, which contains everything that we didn't include in here. Okay, and that's uh, a subtle thing that you encounter when you actually do this on real problems. Okay, so we know how to write everything. Uh, and uh, now let's start to use this to solve a real problem. So for a diatomic molecule that can rotate and vibrate, we have uh, a potential energy, we have kinetic energy, and we have <coughs> rotation. So this is the rigid rotor, if this were RE, R -E, this would be called BE, and, but I'm not writing a zero order problem, I'm allowing the potential to be a function of R, not just harmonic, and the rotational constant operator will also be a function of R. So what we want to do is manipulate this thing into a form that enables us to make contact with the usual expressions for the energy levels. The energy levels of a, a diatomic molecule are usually given by uh, things like this. Uh, I'm going to divide by HC. I'm going to stop with this HC business really soon. Uh, so uh, I just hate it. But you know, that's because spectroscopists are such slobs. So we have omega E, E plus a half minus omega e x e and e plus one half squared. Now, many of you have noticed this symbol, and you wonder, what is this a product of two things? No, it's just one number. And if this is Greek, why is this Roman? But let me assure you, this is not chi, this is x. And, and then it goes on, and omega e y e e plus one half squared. So we have molecular constants for the vibration. Then we have VE, 
jj plus 1 minus uh, gamma p jj plus 1 b plus half and uh, not gamma alpha sorry and gamma is notice we also put a sign here which a minus sign here this isn't an oscillating power series this is just another spectroscopic uh, uh, <coughs> tradition for diatomics which is not followed for polyatomics since the first anharmonicity constant is almost always in the sense that it makes the intervals between vibration levels smaller, we choose to make omega e x e a positive number by putting a minus sign there. And since, as you go up in V, the rotational constant generally gets smaller because the molecule is stretched out, and it's the ballerina effect. You know, when the arms are out, they go slower. When they come in, they go faster. Uh, so alpha, then, is a positive number. And so we put a minus sign here to make that come out the right way. Then we have gamma jj plus 1 d plus a half squared. And then we have d j j plus 1 squared. And then of course there are going to be corrections to the centripetal distortion. And so we get b e alpha e gamma e and we have d e so what we would like perturbation theory to do is to determine all of these things that come in the dumb power series expansion of the energy levels as powers of b plus half and jj plus one to get relate them to the expansion of the potential and the rotational constant operator and then we get all the molecular constants and how they relate to the potential and so this is a way, and it was the way until computers came into spectroscopy and displaced uh, maniacal algebra. Uh, you, you did this perturbation expansion. Okay, so let's, let's set this up. And it isn't pretty, but it's just a lot of repetitions of the same thing. Okay. So, first of all, we like Q, not R, and we're going to define Q as R minus RE. So, at equilibrium, Q is zero. Okay, and so then we write V of Q as one half K Q. power series of Q. Now, what do we do about B of R? I mean, it's a good idea if we're going to have a Hamiltonian that's expressed in terms of B of R and B of R to expand them in the same coordinate and then combine terms so that we don't have to do too much algebra after the fact. Anyway, well, B of R because of this you know, craziness. That's B of R. This is the spectroscopic constant factor. This comes because we have B of R multiplying the operator J squared. And when the operator J squared operates on an angular momentum function, it gives you H bar squared times JJ plus 1. And so that h bar comes from that. And then this 2 mu r squared is just the uh, uh, angular momentum. It's, it's just analogous to p squared over 2 mu for the linear momentum. This is the angular momentum. 1 over 2 mu r squared is the, uh, well, it's the, it, it's, it, yes. OK, so this now. We want to convert this into a function of q rather than r. And this is a subtle point that I, you know, the first time I finally grasped it, I said, oh, fantastic. This is so wonderful. 
Uh, okay, so again, R is R minus RE. So R, R minus RE, or uh, I mean R is R minus RE plus RE, which is Q plus RE. So we have 1 over R squared. We want to write that. Uh, so that's 1 over Q plus RE squared. And now we're going to pull out the RE. And so we have Q over R plus 1 times 2. And this is what we're going to expect. Q over RE. Sorry. So we do that. And we get 1 over RE squared times 1 minus 2 Q over RE plus 3 Q over RE squared. So, so notice in the Hamiltonian, writing V of Q and V of Q, we've got functions of powers of Q. We've, we've got uh, powers of Q. And so we're going to want to evaluate matrix elements of Q, Q squared, Q, etc. Okay. So let's start with H0. And H0 is HC times 1 half KQ squared plus P squared. Let's not put the AC there and see what happens. I'm going to have to take, I'm going to have to uh, deal with AC soon. Do you? Uh, oh, I see. All right. Uh, plus HCBE. AJ plus one. So this is this is the rigid rotor. This. I'm just going to uh, deal with this part because when we start evaluating matrix elements of Q squared and P squared, we discover something interesting. Okay, so we have one half K Q squared. So one half K, and then we are going to convert this to dimensionless Q, which is over here. So we're going to get an H bar over 2 pi C mu like E. And it's Q squared, so we're just going to get H bar HC 2 pi C mu omega E Q at squared. And uh, when you do all the algebra, you end up with just one half h bar omega q hat squared. So there's, you see, you have this k. This is basically square root of k over mu. We multiply by mu. We're left with square root of mu here. We have a square root of k left here, and that's canceling this half of this, and so you end up with a k over, square root of k over mu, and that gives you the omega e. So this gives you that, and the uh, p squared term, p squared over 2 mu, again, we put that into the dimensionless form, and we get h, uh, we get 1 over 2 mu h bar 2 pi c u omega e e hat squared 
and that then simplifies down to uh, one half h bar omega e b f squared. So these two terms have been simplified to the same prefactor times q squared, q reduced squared and p dimensional squared. Okay, so now we pay our price admission manipulating the q hats and the p hats in terms of a's at the beginning rather than later because it leads to simplification. So q hat squared is <coughs> one half a dagger plus a quantity squared. And anybody would know that that's one half times a dagger squared plus a squared. And now we have to be careful because this is quantum mechanics. A dagger a plus a a dagger. And so to simplify these terms, one needs to know about commutation rules, or one just needs to just think about this for a second. So we have a dagger a operating um, now we'd like to, we have A and, and A dagger, so V isn't going to change, so let's put a V here and a V here. So A dagger is going to give us square root of V, and then and, and A is going to give us a square root of V, and A dagger is going to give us a square root of V, because A dagger is taking you from V minus 1 back to V. And you always write the larger of the two quantum numbers. So this just gives you And the other possibility, a, a dagger, v, this takes you from v to v plus 1. So you have a square root of v plus 1. This takes you back down to v, so you have a square root of v plus 1. So this is just going to give you v plus 1. So the combination of these two terms is 2v plus 1, not 2v. And so there's always going to be a little bit of trouble when we write out these a's and a daggers and want to reduce them all to one term which operates between 1b and 1b prime. So there's a little bit of algebra, whether you use commutation rules or just a little bit of this sort of stuff, it does simplify your life. So, so what we get when we recognize this simplification is that uh, um, now remember this was all all done in the very press time between 11 o'clock last night and now so I I have to do a little editing on the fly uh, so we we write the we we want the, the diagonal matrix on of Q at squared, and uh, that gives us uh, well, I just told you we get we get this and that, so we're going to get uh, two B plus one. And we do the same thing for p hat squared. And we get 2v plus 1 over 2 with a minus sign. Uh, no, not with a minus sign. OK, now I, now I know why I did it. Uh, OK, all right. Uh, all right, th th this is correct. Uh, why do I not include off diagonal matrix elements of V? Because Q squared has off diagonal matrix elements delta V2. And P squared also has off diagonal matrix elements delta V2. Are we almost done? What time is it? What? No, it's a quarter up. Okay. You're welcome to listen to this, but it's pretty, pretty awful. <laughs> I'm sorry? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, 
It turns out, remember, that Q squared gave A dagger A plus, uh, I'm sorry, Q squared gave A dagger squared plus A squared uh, plus this, this A dagger A plus A, A dagger. P squared gave minus A dagger squared plus A squared minus A dagger A, A plus. So what's going to happen when you add the P squared term to the Q squared term? These unwanted things cancel, and these wanted things add. That's where that I in the definition, you see we have this I here. That's what makes that happen. So Q squared is off diagonal of V. So is P squared. But the combination of Q squared plus P squared leads to only diagonal elements because the off diagonal elements cancel. But this is something to remember because we're going to be encountering Q squared terms without a P squared term. And we won't get that cancellation. OK, so the, we, we've uh, written the harmonic oscillator in this simplified form. We get one half h bar omega e from the q squared term, and one half h bar omega e from the p squared term. No off diagonal elements. That's the end. And so h zero just gives h c omega e b plus a. So, so we we. Uh, evaluated H0, we've used the A's and A daggers. Now, we get to the more complicated situation. Um, we write H prime over HC in terms of the expansion of the various terms collected before. We have 1, 6, A, Q, Q, that's not with the hat yet, plus 1, 24, B, Q, 4, plus B, E, J, J, plus 1, times minus 2, Q, over R, E, plus 3, Q, over R, E, squared. So, we're going to need to evaluate matrix elements of QQ, Q fourth, Q, and Q squared. Well, we've already done that. This is easy. These are a little bit more complicated. But it's useful, uh, especially since we don't have that much time, to uh, group them according to selection rules. So here's a way of writing summarizing matrix elements. If we, if we write this projection operator like this, this has only diagonal matrix elements of V. And so we can then Q, Q squared, Q, Q, Q squared. We can sort the contributions of the various operators into the various selection rules. So we have V, V, plus or minus 1, we have V, V plus or minus 2, it's a V, V plus or minus 3, V, V plus or minus 4. Okay, and so this one uh, has a contribution from this and from this, because these are even powers of Q. This has a contribution only from this. This has a contribution from this. Uh, and I'm sorry, not from that. Uh, yes. This has a contribution from this and that. This one uh, has 
the, the only operator, the only operators that can change V by three would be Q and Q, Q fifth, so we have one here. And this one is a check mark only here. Okay, so there's only one kind of matrix element for Q, two kinds of matrix elements for Q squared, one for Q cubed, uh, two for Q fourth. So we do the algebra. And, uh, and what we're going to end up getting then is the relationship between uh, this A, B, and R, E, and B, E, and all of these parameters in the expansion of the energy level. So we have omega E, omega X, E. And so that's the, that's the, yes. Does Q cube go plus or minus one also? Yeah. Okay. Good for you. Okay, so the algebra is a little bit tricky, but the main complexity in the algebra is when you say have, have Q hat Q, you're going to get an A, an A, and an A dagger. You're going to have an A. A dagger A, you have A dagger A A, and what you do want to do is combine those. Just as I combined the, the A and the A, dagger, the A A dagger with the A dagger A, and that is a little bit tedious, but le much less tedious than doing out all of the matrix elements and combining at the end. So there's a little bit of algebra with the the from Q4 we can have four terms, and from Q cube where you, you have three terms. But you put it all together, and you do get an expression for each of these terms. And what you're actually going to be able to do is, as you once you set things up in terms of the A's and A daggers, you're going to immediately know which term is going to contribute to which constant. And then you have to do the algebra right, and you get well, how it does actually contribute. The last point is. We have first order corrections to the energy, and we have second order corrections to the energy. The first order corrections come from diagonal matrix elements of even powered cubes, terms, terms with even powers of Q. And they're multiplied by a constant. And because that matrix element isn't squared, that constant is, has a physical consequence. In the second order, we have terms in the expansion that come from a matrix element squared. So that matrix element squared, we've lost the overall sign of the matrix element. But the beautiful thing, which most people don't appreciate, is in that square there are cross terms between the anonymity and the rotational non-rigidity. And those cross terms, even though we've squared the overall thing, they convey the sign of the anonymity term. So there, you, you, in H1, you get signs. In H2, you've lost most of them, but through cross terms between two expansions, you sometimes get some signs. And that's something that most people don't appreciate. So what I would like you to do is to take this algebra, carry it as far as you can, and determine uh, omega e, omega e, x e. A little twiddle on the omega e because you might, when you do the algebra, get something in addition to one, the, the square root of k over mu. You might get something left over in the perturbation expansion. So uh, these are the important terms the first correction to the rotational constant, the centrifugal absorption constant, first correction to the vibrational constant. And there's more. Uh, but the algebra, the higher up you go, the worse the algebra is. And so I would like you to, to, to work on this problem. There is a handout, a uh, supplement to lecture three, which I think does this problem. So uh, the best thing is to do it without looking at that. And, but if you just want to see how it's done, check your algebra against 
that handout, and that's it. Okay, so I'll see you on Monday, and I, I'm going to be doing a version of lecture number three, but it can't be what's in lecture number three, because that's just carrying the problem for the linear molecule, doubly degenerate vibration, to uh, um, further into craziness, because of my neglect of the symmetry. Now, what I might do on Monday is to actually do this correctly in terms of doubly degenerate, cylindrically symmetric uh, basis functions. And, uh, thank you.